Hey there, Crown Corner fam! It's your host, Crown, back with another episode of heartwarming and jaw dropping stories. Today, we're diving into two incredible tales that will make you laugh, maybe cry, but definitely think. So, grab your favorite snack, find a comfy spot, and let's unravel these stories together. And remember, life's a journey with twists and turns. But here at Crown Corner, we navigate it with a smile. Let's get started. Life in our neighborhood has always been quiet. When I moved here with Jamie, my three-year-old lovely child, I hoped for a fresh start. I remember the day I first held Jamie in my arms, his tiny fingers curling around mine. The doctors had gently told me about his Down syndrome, a term that felt foreign and overwhelming at the time. But as I looked into his innocent, trusting eyes, I knew only one thing mattered. He was my son, and I loved him unconditionally. Our early years were tiring but amazing. Jamie's milestones, his first words, his first steps, each moment was a dear memory of mine. As a single parent, balancing work and caregiving was often challenging, and eventually I found a small daycare for Jamie, where he was welcomed with open arms, the staff there adored him, and he quickly became everyone's favorite with his infectious smile and gentle nature. Our neighbors initially greeted us with worms and friendliness. The older couple next door would often invite us over for tea and Jamie loved helping them in the garden. However, not everyone in the neighborhood was as accepting. Whispers and sideways looks sometimes followed us on our walks. I tried to ignore them, focusing instead on the positive interactions and the kindness of people like our next door neighbors. The first time I encountered Karen was at a community barbecue. I had brought Jimmy along, hoping to meet more neighbors and introduce ourselves to the community. Then I overheard someone ask Karen as they watched Jamie play in, Is he normal? She responds with a lowered voice. He's special. But you know how it is with these kids? They can be quite a handful. I remember feeling a sting at her words, but I chose to let it go, not wanting to cause a scene. As Jamie grew older, his differences became more apparent. He struggled with speech and had his own unique ways of interacting with the world. But to me, he was perfect. The incident at the park wasn't our first clash with Karen. She had complained about Jamie's laughter being too loud, about him playing in the front yard where everyone could see. Each complaint was a small cut, a reminder that not everyone saw Jamie the way I did. Even with all this happening, Jamie didn't notice the unfairness around him and kept smiling at everyone. One morning, I thought about taking Jamie to the park. He had been cooped up at home for too long and his giggles were a clear sign that he needed some outdoor fun. I packed a small bag with snacks and Jamie's favorite toy truck. Jamie asks me, Mommy, park now? I replied with a smile, Yes, buddy, park now. The park was just a short walk from our house, relatively empty save for a few joggers and parents with their kids. We found a nice spot near the playground. Jamie immediately ran towards the swings, and I sat on a nearby pinch, keeping an eye on him. Not long after, I noticed Karen walking her dog. She was hard to miss with her brisk walk. Our eyes met and I offered a polite nod, hoping she would just pass by. But luck wasn't to my side today. She approached me and I greeted her. Good morning, Karen. Morning. I see you brought Jamie to the park again. Yes, he loves it here. She looked at Jamie, who was now playing in the sand pit. You know, some parents have expressed concerns. About, well... Um, children like Jamie in a public setting like this. I felt a knot form in my stomach. I'm sorry, what exactly do you mean by children like Jamie? You know, with his condition. It can be unsettling for others. I took a deep breath, struggling to maintain my composure. Jamie has every right to be here, Karen. He's just a child wanting to play, like any other. Just thought I'd pass along the message. Enjoy your day. Was that she walked away, leaving me with my blood boiling. As I watched Jamie, my mind wandered back to previous run-ins with Karen. She had always been overly concerned with the standards of our neighborhood. Last month, she complained about the color of my mailbox being not in line with the neighborhood standards. But her comments about Jamie were a new low. I was pulled from my thoughts by the sound of Jamie calling out. Look, mommy. Castle. I walked over to the sandbox, where he had built a small, lopsided sand castle. That's amazing, baby. I said, kneeling beside him. His face lit up with pride and we high-fived. Suddenly, a shadow loomed over us. 
I looked up to see Karen standing there, her arms crossed. Jamie paused, looking up at her curiously. Back again, Karen? I asked. I need to talk to you about something important. Can't it wait? We're having a good time here. It's just that people are saying they are uncomfortable. They think Jamie's behavior is unpredictable and it's affecting their children's experience at the park. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Jamie was nothing but gentle and joyful. His behavior? Jamie's just plain like any other kid. He has every right to be here. Are we gonna have this conversation again? Karen sighed. I'm just a messenger. Maybe it would be best if Jamie played somewhere more suitable for his needs. And where would that be exactly? This park is for everyone. Jamie is part of this community, whether you like it or not. I'm just trying to keep peace in the neighborhood. You should consider others. Consider others? I am considering my son and his happiness. That's my priority. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. If things escalate, it won't be on me. With that, she turned and left. I watched her go, then I turned back to Jamie, who was now looking at me with concern. It's okay, buddy. Let's just keep playing. The rest of our morning at the park passed without further incident, but Karen's words lingered in my mind like a dark cloud. As the afternoon sun climbed higher, the park began to fill with more families. Mommy, can we have a snack? Jamie asked. Of course, sweetie. As we sat on a bench, Jamie munching happily, I noticed a small group of parents nearby, looking over at us occasionally, whispering among themselves. Then suddenly a little girl approached Jamie, curious about his toy truck. Can I play with it? She asked. Jamie handed her the truck with a smile and said, Truck go vroom! The girl giggled and started playing with the truck on the ground, making engine noises. Jamie joined in and for a moment, I felt a surge of hope. Maybe things could be normal. Maybe. My thoughts were shattered by a shrill voice. Emily, come here right now. A woman, presumably the girl's mother, rushed over and scooped up her girl. I'm sorry, she just runs off sometimes. It's okay, they are just playing. The woman hurried away with her daughter, leaving Jamie looked confused. He asked, friend go? They had to go, sweetie. But it's okay, we can play some more. We tried to resume our activities, but then, I was at warning, Karen appeared again. This time was a man I recognized as the HOA president. Ah, this wasn't going to be good, uh, she said. Good afternoon. We need to talk about the park's community rules. I stood up, holding Jamie's hand. Well, we're not breaking any rules. We have every right to be here. The HOA president added, It's about the comfort and safety of all the park goers. We've received complaints. Complaints about what? My son playing? Karen butted in. It's about him being a disturbance. People are not happy. It doesn't look good. Not happy? He's just playing like any other child. How many times do I have to say this? The HOA president said, This isn't a place for this discussion. We suggest you find a more suitable environment for your child. This is discrimination. You can't just ban my son from the park because he has Down syndrome. Karen yelled. It's not discrimination. It's about what's best for the community. The conversation was going in circles and I could feel Jamie's getting nervous. He didn't understand what was happening, but he could sense the hostility. I took a deep breath and said, We're not leaving. My son has as much right to be here as anyone else. The HOA president then said, We will have to take further action if this continues. And with that, they turned and walked away. I hugged Jamie tightly, whispering, It's going to be okay, buddy. We moved to a quieter part of the park near a small pond where ducks were swimming. Jamie loved animals and I hoped they would distract him from the earlier tension. Our quiet moment was interrupted again when Karen, flanked by two other members of the HOA, approached us again. Uh, why can't you just leave us in peace? Karen stepped closer and shouted, You're being selfish, thinking only about yourself and not how this affects everyone else. Before I could respond, Jamie stepped in front of me and said, No yell at mommy. Karen moved towards Jamie in disgust and yelled, Get back, you little. Instinctively, I stepped in front of Jamie, blocking her. Don't you dare touch my son. Karen reacted instantly, her other hand slapping my face in response to me holding her arm. The sting of the slap was sharp, but it didn't shake me as I once used to train Moi Boran, a form of martial arts that I used to practice before Jamie was born. I was out thinking, my instinct kicked in. I hit butted Karen right then and there, 
while still grabbing her arm. The park fell into a stunned silence. Karen was shaken and immediately fell to the ground, holding her face where I had hit-butted her. I immediately realized what I did and stepped back standing next to my baby. One of the two HOA members shouted, How dare you? I am calling the police. It was in minutes, the police arrived and two police officers approached. One of them asked, What happened here? Karen, now sitting up with blood coming out of her nose, pointing at me. She attacked me. I want her arrested. I felt a surge of fear. No, she came at my son and slapped me when I tried to stop her. I was just defending him and myself. The officers looked between us, then to the crowd. Did anyone see what happened here? A few people stepped forward, and to my relief, they began recounting the events accurately. They explained how Karen had been aggressive towards Jamie and me, and how I had acted in defense. The officers listened intently, taking notes. After a few minutes of discussion, they turned to Karen. Based on witness statements, it seems this was an act of self-defense. We can't arrest her. Karen's face turned red with anger, but she said nothing. The officer then turned to me and said, Do you want to press charges against her for assault? I paused, looking down at Jamie. The thought of dragging this out in court was daunting, but I knew I needed to stand up for these jerks. Yes, I do. For my son's sake, I do. The officer nodded and turned to Karen. You're under arrest for assault and proceeded to read her rights as they handcuffed her. We walked back home in silence that day. The weeks following the incident at the park, I had decided to take legal action against Karen and the HOA, not just for the assault, but also for the ongoing discrimination Jamie had faced. My lawyer was a tenacious man, known for his professionalism and commitment. He believed we had a strong case. He rings me up after I explained everything to him, and it goes like this. Good morning. I've been reviewing the statements from the park and the HOA's past actions. We've got a solid case for both assault and discrimination. We're going to go after them hard. I nodded. I'm glad to hear that. It's not just about what happened at the park, it's about everything Jamie's had to face since we moved here. Exactly. We're going to show the court the pattern of behavior from Karen and the HOA in general. Indeed. And there is something else. Based on their actions and the evidence we've gathered, I think we have a strong case to push for the dissolution of the current HOA board. Their conduct has been egregious. I ask, can we really do that? It won't be easy, but it's possible. If we can prove systematic discrimination and misconduct, the court has the power to dissolve the board and order a reformation. I took a deep breath, then told them, let's do it. It's time they learned they can't treat people this way. We've got a lot of work ahead, but I'm confident. I'll be in touch with the next steps. We're meeting next week to go over the details before the court date. It was a grueling process filled with countless meetings with my lawyer and seemingly endless hours spent in courtrooms. The legal battle consumed a significant part of our lives. It was not just a financial burden, but an emotional and mental one as well. The essence of our case was simple. We sued Karen and the HOA for discrimination and assault. The day the verdict was finally delivered felt surreal. I sat in the courtroom holding my breath as a judge spoke and acknowledged the discrimination and the unjust treatment we had suffered. The financial compensation was significant. It was a really large sum. I'm not gonna disclose how much it was for privacy reasons since you can easily Google it and bam, here we are. But perhaps the most monumental outcome was the dissolution of the HOA board. The court found their actions to be discriminatory and against the principles of a fair and inclusive community. The judge's words. As we move forward from the lawsuit and this whole drama, I truly hope for a future where every child, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, is treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. Thank you for sticking with me throughout my long journey, and I wish you a happy day. Hey, awesome viewers, quick pause in our storytelling. If you're loving these stories, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to Crown Corner, and ring that bell for notifications. Your support means the world to us. Oh, and we love hearing from you. Drop a comment below sharing your thoughts or experiences related to today's stories. All right, let's dive back in. This happened a few years ago right after I graduated college. I would make an eight-hour drive home a few times a year to see family, usually over the holidays. 
During these trips, there was only wilderness, fields, mountains, and tiny towns along the way. During one of these trips, I stopped at a gas station to get some food in. I apparently lost my debit card, or it was stolen. It was a card I never used and looked identical to my main one. So I didn't notice it was missing until later when I got a call from my bank and I saw my account was overdrafted. Being fresh out of college making $12 per hour, the $400 was a huge deal. I worked at a credit card processor at the time, so I had a very unusual familiarity with how credit card transactions worked. This was a debit card but ran as credit. I could have done a chargeback of course, but I knew that merchants were fined $15 for each chargeback on top of the return and got a ding on a record with Visa slash MasterCard slash Amex. If they had too many chargebacks, they would have their processing revoked and incur heavy fines. Merchants are usually mom and pop shops and are usually innocent in this matter, so I decided to give them a call. Also, the charges all came from the same gas station that I lost it at. So I suspected it was an employee who found slash stole my card. I was stupid enough to work it at work. I wanted to let the manager slash owners know so they could keep an eye out for unscrupulous employees. Employee theft is unfortunately common and is not brought to light until a customer brings it up. I thought I would just give them a call and ask for the refund. Easy. I call and a woman answers. I asked to speak with a manager and she says she is a manager. I explained that I had lost my card at that location and someone had later used my card there. I said I didn't want to accuse anyone but I think one of her employees had the card and she may want to investigate. I also said that I'd like a return for all the purchases to save them the hassle of a chargeback. When I usually work with managers in this situation, they are very willing to help and take employee theft very seriously. Instead, I am met with hostility and insults. She told me that I probably deserved it for losing my car in the first place and not noticing, and that I deserved this lesson. She interrupted me and told me to basically go screw myself, none of her employees would steal. Getting a bad feeling, I ask for the number of the owner, and she says there is no owner. What? <laughs> By now, I am shaking in anger, so I tell her I am calling the police and hang up. She tries to call back and I don't answer. By now, I am angry and crying. I have a feeling that I know who did it, but now I need to prove it. I had no intention of calling the cops, because what cops care about some petty credit card theft? It's incredibly hard to prove and most cops have murder and crap to worry about. Lucky for me, this is in the middle of nowhere, population 100 or something. First, I call my bank and ask if they have a record of the exact times the card was used. They gave me the times down to the minute. I then call the police and get a very friendly woman. It seems she is not busy and actually listens to my story, including the hostile manager. I ask if she's able to go look at the surveillance tapes or something like that, and she says the store is five minutes away and she will stop by. I guess she felt sorry for me or was bored, but I'll take it. She says she'll give me a call if she finds anything. I eagerly awaited her call, but was not expecting much. A couple days go by and I get a call from the nice officer lady. She says that she went by the store and reviewed the footage. At the exact time I told her the cameras caught the hostile manager making the purchases and signing receipts for the exact same amounts with a card that looked exactly like mine. Even better, they were going to charge her with felony identity theft since making purchases on someone's card without permission is identity theft on top of monetary theft, at least in my state. They asked if I wanted any restitution but my bank had refunded me the stolen money so I declined. I was absolutely not expecting a cop to go out of their way to help me and I was definitely not expecting it to result in an arrest. I felt a sense of pride for actually sticking up for myself and not just taking the money from my bank and letting the thief go away. I'm pretty small and non-confrontational person, but that day, I felt like a badass. If she'd been nice and worked with me or even just apologized and done the returns, I would not have called the police. Because she was so rude and unhelpful, she got a felony instead. And that's a wrap on today's episode of Crown Corner. We hope these stories inspired you, made you think, or simply gave you something to talk about. Remember, life is full of unexpected stories, and here we share them all. The good, 
the bad, and everything in between. Thank you for joining me and don't forget to keep spreading positivity and kindness wherever you go. Until next time, this is Crown, signing off.